you know, a lot of people never open their own firm and really the business aspect isn't ultimately important to them. But to me, it, it, it ended up being very important. So, Episode 92. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about strategies, tips, and secrets for running a profitable, successful, and more importantly, an impactful architecture practice. Generous support for today's show is provided by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built specifically for architects. ArchiOffice is, and actually it's more affordable than you think, uh, I was just given notice uh, this past year that they now offer a low monthly rate that won't break the bank, especially for small practitioners. And in addition to that, for a limited time only, ArchiOffice is offering up to two seats of the software absolutely free for a full year to startup firms, which is pretty cool. So you can go check that out at ArchiOffice.com. Today's guest is architect Peter Tui. Peter's been an acquaintance and a friend of mine for a while. He's the owner and principal of Tui Architects based out of Baltimore, Maryland. This coming April 1st will mark 10 years in business as a sole practitioner right there on April Fool's Day. In today's episode, you'll listen in as Peter Tui shares the lessons he's learned from over 10 years of being a sole practitioning architect. You'll discover how to start an architecture firm right away even if you have no money and no current clients. And if you already own a firm, you'll be interested to discover how you can profit from the projects you don't take and slash your operating expenses by 25% or more using the simple business arrangement that Peter reveals in this interview. Now, but before I jump in today's episode, I want to remind you about the special product I'll be revealing soon called the 150015 Project. So it's a goal to radically improve the businesses and lives of 150 architects in 2015 to really make the mission of business of architecture here more impactful. And I'm keeping the exact details under wraps for now, but I guarantee you've never seen anything like it. If you want to be one of these 150 architects or designers, head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 150 to get on the early notification list. I'll send the details of the program to you first. Okay, so with that teaser out of the way, I want to welcome our guest today, architect Peter Tui from Baltimore, Maryland. Peter, welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm, you know, I'm excellent out here in California. We've gotten a little bit of rain, but fortunately, you know, unfortunately, not enough to break the uh, the dry spell we've had out here. Okay, okay. So, I just like to start by saying thank you. So, I've listened to almost every one of your shows now. I've gone back and listened to the ones I jog like probably three or four times a week, and uh, so I put the podcast in, and, and off I go. And it's been just great, you know. So, you know, going back to what was that guy? Um, Gregory Lavarda. Yeah, Greg Lavarda. Mm -hmm. Yep, so did that one and obviously listened to Tom Main, which, I mean, you've had some phenomenal guests on. And so uh, what I like most about your show is I think it makes me, um, just expands what I think of as, as possible for architects, you know, and so I, I just appreciate it. So thank you. I love it. Thank, thank you, Peter, really for that sincere feedback. And I know I have my notes up here for today's show, and I can tell you that our guests are in for a great treat, especially those of you who are sole practitioners, because Peter's just going to dive into you know the lessons he's learned from almost 10 complete years as a sole practitioning architect. Uh, you know, Peter, you have beautiful work, and I, we're going to talk a little bit about that, I think, in our, in our next episode. But you know, thank you, for the, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it, and I look forward to jumping into the, the meat of today's show. Go ahead. So tell me, Peter, just let us know a little bit about you, about your practice, but let's start out with your origin story. Let's start about, you know, how, take us back and tell us how you got started so we can get an idea of, you know, you have a, kind of a different story and an interesting model that other people can potentially use. Right. So, so first, I uh, went to college, Notre Dame, graduated, I guess, 1988, and then spent a couple years in Cincinnati, and we moved, my wife and I, to Germany for three years. So I learned German. And I got a job in a German firm, became a uh, you know, designer there for you know, like three years, and then came back to America, worked in a firm here in Baltimore for about 10 years, and um, was kind of getting restless. And I got a, a, a letter, it was a letter actually, not an email, a letter, to, that was addressed to all architects, or maybe, maybe not all, and it was, a, was it an offer. You know, you could open up your new office under our office, in our office space, and, uh, you know, come talk to us about it. And I almost threw that letter out, you know, because I didn't know, I didn't understand it, I, you know, it seemed odd, but it is odd. 
And, um, and so, but I didn't. Instead, I called, and then I was interviewed to, for this position. They interviewed the, uh, so was, the guy's name is Bruce Finkelstein. His firm is HBF Plus Architects. And at the time, he had a, um, a partner, and, and her name is Kitty Daly. And you know, so they interviewed me. And so, you know, I was like the rough equivalent of like maybe Woody Harrelson coming into Cheers. You know, so the young architect and uh, had a little bit too much energy, but maybe not quite enough smarts yet. And, uh, and so, but, but there I was, I, you know, opened up my own office. And, and the deal was, is that, because, you know, again, remember 10 years ago, it was right before the recession started. So he was flush with work. And so, you know, people would call him and say, you know, love to work with you. And when can we get started? And he'd say, well, maybe four months. And they said, well, wait a minute, four months. And so what I was, what my job really was, was to shorten his backlog. And, uh, and so I paid him a certain percentage of the money that I made. That was our deal. And so for that, not what I billed, but what I actually came in. And so for that, um, we, you know, he was my mentor, still is. I'm having lunch with him next week. Um, and, you know, I, I lean on him for everything, you know. So he's just been, you know, for me, the perfect mentor. Um, mm. So, but, but it's, I think it's a real, uh, something that, that other people could actually do. So for me, you know, right now, I have a little bit too much work. And so I have options. You know, one is I could hire an employee. I could get contract, uh, you know, draftsman or that kind of thing. I have options. But one of the options I have is to you know, do the same thing that, that Bruce did for me, you know, become that mentor and, uh, and help someone in the next generation. So probably, you know, roughly somewhere between 30 and 40 years old, maybe something like that. Um, you know, they'd have some experience and all that. So, but that interview was, was a very mm -hmm. odd interview because I thought I was interviewing them, you know, but the reality was they were interviewing me, uh. and, right? And it was, it was very clear, you know, they were looking for the certain type of person who could really do the work, didn't need a lot of guidance, but was going to need some. Um, but, the, but the advantages were huge. So the first advantage was I, I went in and took their contracts and just erased HBF Plus and put two architects on it. So I didn't have to figure that part out. Um, you know, Kitty was the person who did all the books. So again, I didn't have to figure that part out. So I went almost like, a, you know, instead of jumping into the fire or into the swimming pool, I just was wading into the shallow end because there was so much. I mean, I, I, I couldn't fail, you know, the, from a business perspective, that was not going to be possible. Yeah. So it was, the, and, and, and think about that though, like, like, like a young architect that can't, from a business, but now I could have failed from an architectural standpoint. That would have been possible, but not from a business perspective. And I think the opposite is true of almost every architect that hangs out the shingle. You know that they could fail from a business perspective, but probably not from an architectural perspective. Mm. So, anyway, so it was great. That that's a great. I love the win-win aspect of that of that setup. So that wasn't an employment relationship. It was not employment. No. And so so. So my company was my company. I was in their office space. So, you know, and I'm obviously writing a check to them every month. So I'm, def you know, making their business much more profitable. They're incurring no liability for whatever it is that I do. Um, and, you know, the only part that was odd was when a, when a person called them but ended up getting me. Mm. And so, and, and that worked fine, you know, again, but that's not going to work for everybody. You know, your personality has to be able to to, to adapt to that, um, and it's, but it did. It, it, we never really had a problem with that. I thought it was going to be a problem, but it never really was. And you know, I, I would imagine that with today, with you know, more use of mobile phones, you know, mm -hmm. voice over IP computers, that you know, it'd be pretty easy to get two separate numbers. Did, are you saying you had the same number in the office as Bruce? Yeah, so we did, okay. and um, and. So, but for the first year or two, you know, people called um, HBF Plus, and then, you know, they, they would decide whether they wanted the project, and if they did, fine. Um, and if they didn't, they would say, well, we have this uh, young up-and-comer, you know, like, why don't you talk to him? Mm. And you know, it was my responsibility at that point to get the job, and most of the time that, that happened. So, that was, but again, it was just this... Um, I knew I could do the architecture. You know, at that point in time, I was about 40. 
and I was, you know, a good enough architect. That was that was clear in my mind, at least. Um, but I also knew that I was not a good enough businessman. Mm. You know, we had business courses in college, and I um, had no idea at the time how important they were, and therefore didn't pay much attention, or it didn't sink in. I don't know, but it didn't. They, they didn't have a big impact on me, and that's a shame, really. Um, but it's the reality. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, there's just so much to learn in architecture school. You know, I almost don't know how you could successfully do both, really learn the business and then also learn how to be a great designer and architect. It just seems almost impossible. Yeah, and it, it, it's, maybe it's a left brain, right brain kind of, type of thing. And, and, there's and, that, and, yep. Uh, and there's a, you know, when, when you sort of get in your mind that you're going to become an architect and, and then there's all this, you know, you have to learn about Le Corbusier, you have to learn about Mies, you have to learn about Frank Wright, you have to learn about all these famous architects. And, and how they do what it is they do. And, and the business just seems like just a distant, you know, like a problem that you may never have, which is true in some ways. You know, a lot of people never open their own firm and really the business aspect isn't ultimately important to them. But to me, it, it, it ended up being very important. So, Well, it's, it's the, as I like to say, it's the oil that makes everything run. You know, if you're not generating that profit. Now, you mentioned, let's go back. So that's a very interesting model. Peter, that other people could um, use. Uh, it sounds like Bruce sent out uh, maybe a mass a mass letter right. to certain individuals. I think I think they were AIA members. I think is what he did, um, and I, I bet he sent out about a hundred. How he figured out which hundred, you know, like he didn't send obviously a letter out to the owner of a firm, but he sent the letters out to people who had, you know, been an architect for ten years. I don't know what he did, you know, yeah. but he found this. And, um, and he said they interviewed about 12 people and selected me. So mm. that was a, but, but I, I like the interview was, was very cordial, very comfortable right from the start. And so, um, but it was, again, you know, I really thought that I was the one who was going to be doing the interviewing and it was the exact opposite. It was very funny when I realized, oh, wait a minute, I'm being interviewed, not, not the other way around. So anyway. mm, interesting. Well, did that did that help you out at least a little bit in terms of your confidence going in? Because obviously, you know, I think when you're the one interviewing, you're going to come in there more confident as opposed to feeling like you're on right. trial. And that probably did help the the first. And then when it flipped, which was I realized fairly early, you know, my initial impression had already been made and all that kind of stuff. So 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 that that probably worked out fine. And and and, and I realized as soon as I knew I was being interviewed that I really had nothing to lose. You know, yep. so, so I had a job. It was a good job. I enjoyed my job. And, um, and so, you know, at that time, I was a designer, and I designed very, very high-end residential and, and religious buildings, and mostly synagogues, and, um, and which was great for me because if there's any building project that's even more important than someone's house, it might be their place of worship. But I don't think there's a second one. So I, I like that. I like that, that my clients think that their job is really important to them mm. you know? and so that, that's important to me so if they if they don't if they're not interested in their own project then i'm unlikely to be interested in their project mm. so that's just one of the ways that i differentiate clients now you know if they're you know again like they need this for some reasons and i'm more interested in their project already um but so, so i had that job it was a good job I was doing work I loved, and but at the time I was uh, their designer. So I would do the design, and then I would you know move down the line to somebody else for the construction drawings, and and I would throw in as much as I could detail wise, um, so that it wouldn't get ruined in the construction you know drawing process. Uh, and there were a bunch of different people there that worked there that I sort of you know moved to, and I would just look over their shoulders, and you know I was nervous. Wait a minute, you can't do that, you know. Like the, and uh, so it was, but for me, that's a, one of the main reasons I wanted to open my own firm was a little more freedom from design, but also to to grow up, you know. So so for me, I thought I was really only half of an architect, a designer. I didn't mm -hmm. really get into the construction drawings, which you know people tell me, contractors tell me that they like my drawings because there's enough information, not too much, and it's um and they can find it and you know all that kind of stuff. So so that that was. You know, again, that, that's been a growing experience for me, so I've, I've enjoyed that. 
Now, now, Bruce, is he is he a fairly good marketer? It sounds like he understood the even with his interview process or his process of finding you. You know, if we look at that from a marketing exercise, we can apply that to anything. You know, so a lot of times as architects, we don't think about when we're hiring someone or when we're doing any business relationship. You know, we're going to follow the the pattern of marketing. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say he's he's a very interesting thinker. So his. Um, um, a lot of people tell that, that I'm an interesting thinker because they don't think like architects. So, so I, I would think I'm kind of a somewhat normal in the architecture range, right? Bruce really isn't. He's a very interesting thinker. Um, so I'm always probing him for um, different types of uh, almost on any topic. Um, so because I because I never quite know how he's going to approach any particular topic, but on the specific topic of marketing, he's he, he thinks about that a lot, and you know. And again, he's about ten years older than I am, plus or minus. So the computer, he's probably better at that than I was, which is a little bit unusual for people. Mostly, you know, people ten years younger than I am excel at that. The ten years older people usually don't, and and sometimes spectacularly so. You know, like I can do email, and that's about it. You know, kind of thing. And and he's the exact opposite of that. So he realized the potential and the power, and um. So, yeah, very interesting guy. Interesting. Well, I know a lot of people that I talk to, Peter, you know, they they think that, I guess they, they expect remarkable results. So, I, I think it's interesting that you pointed out that he, he possibly sent out letters to 100 people mm -hmm. and he ended up with one person. Right, so that's is, behind the scenes. That's what we don't realize is what's happening. When, when you're doing any sort of business development activity, you're contacting dozens and dozens of people to get that one person that works out right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, uh, yeah. So, so for me, again, I feel very, very fortunate. It was, you know, obviously something I didn't deserve, you know, I didn't do anything to earn that, but it's worked out extremely well. So then like maybe three years ago, Kitty retired. So this is by the way, the same woman who on several occasions was mistaken for my wife. And she said, love that. Every, oh, really? You think we're probably, yeah. And, and we did have that kind of a relationship that, um, that people would, you know, we were very familiar with each other and it was, you know, we were close friends. And, um, and so, and she does look very, very young. But having said that, you know, she was, in any case. Um, oh, so their, their whole point was, to, you know, when they, when they were bringing people in, that, that, you know, both of them interviewed. I had to get along with both of them. Again, I didn't know this. Um, and it was, was just, it worked out very, very well. And so she was I mean you shared overhead mm -hmm. so basically the office so I'm just trying to get an idea let's we'll get the the idea of this uh, of this of this deal here basically you came into this this architect that had an established practice you know yeah. he had the office already set up he had all the forms he was running a great business so you were able right. to fly underneath his his wing um, mm -hmm. Kitty who probably did everything from answering the phone to keeping the books to right. you know probably maybe even drawing for... some did she ever get into drawing client meetings too so mm. instead of me going out uh, for that initial consultation because they really want to bend the ear of the architect she would go out and that saves an enormous amount of time mm. and she was was um, good at that which is a real talent you know yeah. and it's not something you can you could probably learn it but maybe not everyone can learn that talent um, but she would throw out a couple of ideas she was not an architect um, but she'd been in the business for years. She and Bruce had worked together for, I want to say, 20 or so years before I even got involved. Mm -hmm. So so a lot of experience and super nice woman. And that was easily, you know, you knew that she was super nice within seconds of meeting her. So somehow she got that across. I don't even really know how. So she's a real people person. She could connect with people, empathize with them. Right. So that was great to have that support network as you're starting your firm. Um, was there any time, Peter, when you thought, you know, th you know, thirty percent, man, that's it. Feels like I'm giving away so much. Well, you have to understand, like I knew nothing about business when I started, and so, you know, like my wife does our checkbooks and that kind of stuff. So, so really was a, a very minimal. You know, again, I'm, I'm good at the visualizing three dimensions, designing that kind of thing. Um, so. So it didn't occur to me at that time that that was a bad deal because, again, I have this employee 
And, you know, and I have her essentially full time. We split her, but I didn't need her for more than, uh, so I, I, I frankly think I got a great deal. So yeah. Excellent. So even to this day, looking back, you still are comfortable with the, the terms. Right. Well, that's, that's perfect for a win-win. Yeah. So, and then how long did you keep that, that relationship in terms so of the firm? Seven, yeah. So it was seven years. Okay. And, uh, and then Kitty retired and, and Bruce, you know, had a couple of different ideas rumbling around his head, which is normal for him. And so he thought it was probably in my best interest that we don't go forward because he wasn't comfortable signing three year leases. So mm -hmm. uh, wow. on space and once Kitty retired, we didn't really need the, the, um, the as much office space as we had. That lease was, was, was you know, it was, was, was coming to a close. And so it all came to a head and I started looking for my own office space and found something um, that was you know, again, perfect for me. So. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. Archie Office has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. Now, and Peter, you do, I mean, gorgeous residential work. And I think in next episode, we're going to get into some of that and, and talk about some of the images and some of the mm -hmm. tools you use to do that and make that easy. But before we do that, I just wanted to, since we're on the sort of the business development, finding work, marketing, ask you a little bit about during those seven years and even up till now, what have you started using that has brought in projects? What have you found to be working in your practice to bring in new work? And not just new work, but work that you like. Right. So the first thing that I did, and I still do, uh, is the home show. So, so a lot of architects sort of... Um, uh, think of the home show as something beneath them, really, and and then, um, and really, I think I thought that too. So this is um, this is the in a convention center. It's a local home and garden show where contractors will have their wares, any home furnishings, and right. you would have, uh, you know, as an architect, any professional can go in there. Anyone basically can go in there and, and rent a booth. Is that right? That's exactly correct. So so when I did it, the uh, and I you know again, it, it comes at the end of February this year. So I'm gearing up for it again. Um, but I, I said this last year, and I'm saying it again this year. I, I, I think this is going to be the last year, and I'll get into why that is. But the, but the first thing you have to do for your, your booth is it's a, uh, you have to differentiate yourself from contractors. Because there's going to be 20, 15 as a minimum, contractors. And in all the 10 years I've, I've done it, it's a, I've only ever been the only architect. So... But, but people come into my booth and they think that I'm a contractor. And so I have to, to visually differentiate my booth from any contractor's booth and, and make it look sort of architect -y. Can I use that? Is that a word? Um, it is. Yeah, okay, good. For yeah. now, we'll, 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 we'll claim it's a word. Yep. And, um, and so that, that's, that's like the first step. And then the second step is how you actually look. So what I wear is actually important. You know, I underdressed at times. I wore jeans, you know, to, to blend in with the crowd. But that makes you look more like a contractor. And so that's a, which isn't bad, by the way. Being mistaken for a contractor is a compliment, yeah. right? But it's also the wrong image, mm -hmm. right? So, it's, so if I were mistaken for Brad Pitt, that would be a compliment, but still the wrong image, you know? So, yeah. um, so same thing. And... You know, so I, I, I landed on, you know, sort of a, a professory kind of um, outfit that I would wear. You know, I'm wearing jeans right now. You know, I, I, don't, I don't particularly feel the need to dress up. But for that show, I do. I, I dress up a little. But you can't be so dressed up that you, you appear standoffish. Yeah, so, what, yeah. Did, what, what tuned you into the fact that people were perceiving you differently based upon how you dressed? Kitty. So, oh, it's all right. mm -hmm. so, so people would come up to her. So the first thing I did was try to dress up like an architect, you know, like a wear all black or something like that. And uh, which I, I, by the way, really like. So, so I have plenty of those kinds of outfits and, uh, and, and they would come up to her and then she would introduce them to me, but nobody came up to me. And so I said, okay. And then she said, well, you know, you kind of look, you know, like you're smarter than they are or you're dressing that way. 
And so dress down a little. So then I would do the jeans, right? And that didn't work either because then it was like, a, well, you know, when you got out in the field and da da da, da I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's not what you think. And and we would go on and it would confuse them. And you don't want confusion. That's not never a good thing. And so you know, I landed on this sort of, uh, um, and and it works. And so you know, Kitty would knit. She would sit there and she'd knit. And people would come up to her like they would interrupt her knitting. But they'd have a couple of questions, and, and she'd say, "Okay, I'll, I'll put this down," and you know. And it was very—I mean, I, I almost half want to learn how to knit just to, uh, you know, so people would come up to me, and that's a, that's a big part of the booth. You know, the booth design is also really important to get. You know, we always did a ten by twenty booth, and um, and half of the booth was a place to sit down, talk about their projects, because the conversation is going to be fifteen minutes, and um, and then you know the other half of the booth is just images. Um, you know, of, of my work. So, so people were sort of almost like a museum kind of come in and they had to feel that they could come in without being accosted, which at a home show, they're going to be accosted, right? Now, like every booth needs their business and they understand that as a, you know, so I was trying to do the opposite. And, you know, again, like several of my best clients came from the home show and several of my largest commissions came from the home show as well. But you have to be cognizant of the downside of a home show. You know, the first is it's it's exhausting. You know, I, I come home, I'm completely wiped out, and uh, and my wife used to make fun of me. She said, "Let me see, what you sat around and talked all day." So, <laughs> well, what that's interesting, Peter. Is is that because you're an introvert? No, I think it's because you're you have to be on, right? So yeah. so you're on, and it's not for it's for. 10 hours, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I'd come home and I would just be um, completely, you know, just, I just go right to bed, you know, yeah. to, to, to that and, that would, and then get up and do it again the next day. And I'm, I'm kind of an odd mix of introvert and extrovert, so, so I'm fine to be with people for long extended periods of time, but then when I've had enough, I can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, um, and it just turns completely off, and so sometimes we'll, We'll be at a party and my wife will look around, where did he go? <laughs> and she'll know, I'm like, I don't know, 15 minutes or whatever. I just need to, to, to decompress. Um, so in any case, so the home show is exhausting, way harder than you think it's going to be. Mm. You know, setting up the home show is hard. Finding, you know, the right design is critical and difficult. Um, and you have to be willing to do smaller projects. So, so people are going to come in with basements. They're going to come in with everything. Um, you know, one room additions and that kind of stuff. I, um, and I didn't say yes to everyone who came through and I didn't try to, but you have to kind of be willing that, that that's a, a possibility. And, you know, for me, you have to also understand the, the good about that, you know, so small projects, again, architects don't typically say, Oh, I want to, what I really need is, you know, 20 more really small projects, but then you get 20 customers that are wildly happy with what you've done, and then now they're chirping. And so, so it's a uh, it's building the network. So, I've worked on many, many. Pro I mean, some years 25, 30 projects per year, and now you got 25, 30 people chirping mm -hmm. in a positive way. So that's a, um, it, it's one of the benefits, but it's, it's frenetic, you know. So, so you know, 25 clients in a year is 25 people who believe that their project is the single most important project on the planet and they're right you know to them for sure and i have to be able to bring that same level of interest to the project otherwise you know they're going to know it and so you know so for me that's a and it's frenetic you know you know contractors are calling the questions for not one or two projects but you know 10 or 20 are under construction it's so, you know, just keeping that straight in my mind. So, so now I still do small projects, but I'm much more selective about them. Um, and it's not because of the people, it's because of me. I can only do so much, you know, I can only handle so many projects and be, you know, as my best for that number. So I limit them. Yeah. Well, just on a side note, I do have a picture of your, uh, your home show booth here. So we'll go ahead and put that. Uh, on the episode, so people can see the picture okay, good. Of, of what it looks like, and you know how much in terms of uh, how many days, how much time, and how much mo money investment does it take to put up a booth like this? Okay, that's a good question. So, 
So you, you need a way to display the artwork. I chose these metal grids that were in um, stores because, again, I, I thought they had a, a very interesting open feel, um, and they were relatively inexpensive. Um, carpeting is, I think, is a key because people, you know, they're walking for miles and they're saying they're going to be tired by the time they get to your booth. And carpet padding, I mean, I can't tell you how many people walk into my booth and just smile just because of the carpet padding and they feel it. Mm. A place to sit down, so you need a table, chairs. Uh, I also have a computer, a little uh, rice bowl Mac that I set up that just have rolling photos, to, again, just to grab people's attention. Uh, lighting's key. I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers because it was 10 years ago. I've not changed any of them. So, so the initial investment was relatively high, but if you amortize the investment over the 10 years, it's almost nothing. Yeah. So um, the booths at the, the Timonium Home Show, the one that I actually do, is about, I think it's about $2,700. So that's not inexpensive. Having said that, you know, one person signs up and it pays for itself. Yeah. So, and, and it's funny because everyone else is going after the maximum number of people signing up. I'm going after a very different, you know, I'm going after a couple of people to sign up for, for you know, large projects. And, and it's happened, you know. So, again, like, uh, I can think of off the top of my head, um, you know, probably half a dozen projects that were, you know, commissions or projects that were, you know, half a million dollars or more. Mm -hmm. So for construction costs. So these are not small projects. My, I, I did a net zero house that came from the home show. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so it was a whole house out of the ground, to, you know, that paid for every home show I'll ever do, you know, that, that commission. But I also have done, you know, I did a project that um, that uh, Marvin Windows used in their ads, their national ads, and um, and so that came from the home show. Um, so again, it's it's not. I mean, there are basements and one room additions and um, and that kind of stuff. But um, but I get to choose what I want to do. Not you know, at the beginning I was doing whatever came in, but now it was uh, you know I'm very selective actually. And what other ways have you found to be successful in terms of bringing in new business? Okay, so, so the, the, there's really two ways. The, the, the first one is I, I do a monthly uh, email marketing campaign, which if, uh, if you send that out, that's what you call it. But if you get that, it's called spam, right? So that's the, that's the thing. And, um, but what I like about my email marketing campaign is it's called One From 2E. Um, a friend of mine who uh, works who owns um, Blue Ocean Ideas, his name's Brody Bond, came up with this idea. He's the one who developed my first, wasn't well, actually my second website, but my first real website. And um, and he liked the name 2E Architects, and he wanted me to, to to get out there a little bit more than I was. And so, you know, one from 2E was his little tagline. And it's a one photo with one caption once a month. And what, I, what I've found is, is that that's enough for me to be sort of top of mind, or maybe not top of mind, but in the consciousness of people. So now I've got somewhere around 550, 600 maybe um, people I send this out to every single month, and, and they look forward to it. So, so my spam is looks forward to. Uh, and, and, and in fact, a couple of months ago, because the um, because of a technical glitch, it, I was at least two month two weeks late. And I got phone calls. Where's my email? <laughs> and uh, so they, they know that it's the you know the first week I'm going to send it out. It's usually the first Tuesday or something like that. Um, so so anyway, so it's 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 good to to be on people's mind, right? Yeah. And, and so you know at the same time, you know I get um, an email from like Staples or something every single day. Mm. And, and it's just too much, yep. and, you know. So, so I, I had to be very careful about what was too much and what was not enough. And, and Brody wanted me to do it every two weeks, and that's probably better from a marketing standpoint. But I have to do it, you know. So, so it takes away from from what the other things I would be doing. And um, and I wasn't sure that I wouldn't want to get every two weeks. So I, I settled on once a month. I'm not sure that's exactly the right number, but it's uh, it's worked well for me. And, and then, in what ways does it work well, Peter? Peter. Well, again, people people forward this email to other people. Um, if, you know, again, like my 
email marketers, whatever. I mean, you know, they, they go to parties all the time, and then somebody says, oh, you know, we're thinking about it, da 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 And then, well, they talk to Peter. And, and they, they've gotten this email now for two years, every single month for two years, and it's, it just comes right to them. And so they become my uh, agents, really. And it's uh, and that's that happens has happened more than once. It happens all the time. Um, so that's a that's a that's been a, a benefit to me. Um, and you know, and again, my clients get them, and they see their photograph. And, wow, look in it. So so it's um, it engenders goodwill. It's just it's just a win all the way around. So so I really like it. The um, and then the second thing I've done for marketing uh, is is actually quite funny. It involves you, Enoch. But the um, but when I started ten years ago, nobody over the age of thirty, I thought, was actually using the internet to find an architect. It's because of the, you know, again, ten years ago was a long time ago, as far as the internet goes. So I, I didn't put much stock into my own website back then. And after maybe a year or two, I made a, a one just with a, a Mac website, and it was simple and it was not overly elegant. It wasn't. It wasn't representing two architects very, very well at all. And, um, and then somebody told me in a meeting that I looked up your stuff on the website. You know, they, they, and I said, wow, did people actually do that? I didn't, I didn't believe it at that time. And that now, I can't even imagine. I mean, everybody finds me through the website. And so, you know, you can look up twoearchitects.com. And, and I, you know, Enoch, your company, the um, working with you and, and and Eric and Richard, and then the person who helped me was was Hope on the website. It was all phenomenal job. And you know now the website has um, what you guys call the monkey's fist. And uh, for people who don't know what that is, it's a free giveaway. You know, so I'm giving away um, how to hire an architect, a pamphlet, but also how to begin your design project, and also how to hire a contractor. So any one of those three, and the only thing you have to pay me is not money it's it's an email address and so those people will be you know they, they first get a um, a couple of emails talking about you know hey you know are you starting a project and you call that kind of stuff and then that goes on for maybe two months or maybe three months and then after that they'll get right into the one from 2e so once a month after that so it's 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 going to make my that the one from 2e reach even further so I'm excited. I'm really excited. We've, the the website's been live for about two weeks, um, and I've gotten I've sent out maybe not one of those a day, but it's been almost that. So yeah. so it's been you know so I mean, and that, people, that's incredible, right? Really is. Yeah, so but that that website, yeah, that website that uh, that Peter's referencing, uh, my company, which I, I have two partners. Um, anyways, it's Architects Marketing, Architects with an S. So it's not Business of Architecture, but it's ArchitectsMarketing.com. And maybe Peter, since you're involved in that program, you want to tell our listeners a little bit about the program itself, about what you've learned in there. We have free resources as well as paid resources on that site. You know, what's been your experience um, being part of this marketing program that I put together with uh, Eric Bobro and Richard Petrie? Well, the, it, it's, it's more than, obviously, more than the website. Um, it's, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a resource on, on how to talk to people. So, again, I'm, I'm really looking forward to a trip to Vegas where I'm, I'm going to sit down and meet Richard for the first time, and, but he's already given me advice on, on how to overcome objections when, some, when somebody says, you know, X, you, you can turn that around. And it's, um, you know, again, you know, not, not, that's nothing that, that ever came up in architecture school. So, so it's, uh, you know, the, the way that, that people think um, is critical to how they make their decisions, which, of course, impacts me if they're deciding or not to, to hire two architects. So, so knowing that, but, but also, you know, when, when, when you and Richard and, and Eric talk, I always have to put that through the lens of sort of two architects. So I don't want to be, and I don't really, you know, again, I have plenty of work, which is great. You know, that's, that's a, that's a luxury. I understand that. Um, but I don't want to be too markety, you know, so, so I'm trying to be just enough marketing without being too much. And if, but again, if I had employees, then I would probably have a very different, you know, feel because I'm I, I have, you know, again, their families, their spouses, their children, their 
college education, you know, the kids or whatever. So, so I, I, I wouldn't, you know, be able to be quite as cavalier as I am. And I would probably be much more focused on, you know, again, the, the marketing with the capital M, let's just say. So my focus now is to be, you know, marketing in, in the way that sort of the, that is comfortable for me, which isn't necessarily good marketing. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it just sounds like you, you understand what works and you're going to take it as far as you need to, you know, um, and not, not further. You know, obviously it could be taken pretty far. Right. And I would say one more thing is that, that I now understand a lot more about how that works. I don't know anywhere near as much as you do, but, the, um, but I'm learning. And, you know, and again, before we met, I knew a little you know, like, well, Brody helped with the one from 2E, and, um, and, and Eric helped with that, too. So we, we had a, uh, a conversation that, that gave me the idea that that would be possible, you know, when Eric and I spoke. And then Brody mm -hmm. and I had lunch like, less than a month later, maybe two weeks later, and he came up with the idea without me having to say anything. But I was preconditioned, you know, by Eric to, you know, to, to, to think that idea was, was good before he even said it. Um, and again, I'm smart enough to realize a good idea when it hits me right in the face. So, so that's at least a good thing. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. I know it's been, uh, it surely has been a pleasure, you know, having you in the program. And, you know, when you talk about meeting, uh, meeting personally, we are, so that's a live event. Uh, listeners probably don't know about that because it's part of the Architects Marketing Academy that we're doing right now. But what, we, what we're doing is we're throwing a live event in Vegas. Uh, myself, Eric Bobro, Richard Petrie's flying up from New Zealand, going to be there. We're going to meet members of our program together and just have a two-day sit-down, you know, hash it out, talk about business challenges, and put our minds together, map out a plan for the future. So that's happening February, uh, the end of February, February 23rd and 24th, I think. Right, and then that sold out, right? Yeah, it is. That sold out, and we have another one that we're doing on the next Friday and Saturday, the 27th and the 28th. So we rented this nice penthouse suite at the top of the Mandalay Bay overlooking the just incredible exuberance of Las Vegas, which is just a crazy city, you know, especially for architecturally speaking, it's just rather ridiculous. Right. And, and, and I would say that in a positive way and a negative way. So in other words, ridiculous is a high compliment yes. and ridiculous as maybe not a compliment at all. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, so, so Vegas isn't really my favorite, uh, City, I don't gamble, I don't do anything like that. But um, but the uh, but but Vegas is great for people watching, and so I, I, I can't wait. Yep. Well, I can't either, Peter. It's going to be great. Well, thanks, okay. thanks for touching. Uh, it sounds like we've covered a lot uh, in this particular episode. We talked about a very interesting model about how you got started in your firm. Win-win for any established architects. It seems like that's great because it takes some of the load off of the plate of a seasoned practitioner like yourself who has mm -hmm. extra work to go around. Uh, it helps a young up and coming hungry architect who may lack some of the experience and needs, right. needs a little roost. So that is just awesome. I would love to hear if any of our listeners end up doing that. If you have any additional questions for Peter about how that works, Peter, how can people reach out to you uh, to get some additional information? So the website is probably the easiest way to do it. So it's the number two letter E and a hyphen, then the word architects with an S dot com. So the S is kind of hopeful. Maybe there will be S in the future, but at the moment it's, you know, just me. Excellent. Well, thanks Peter for joining us on the business of architecture. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.